Thanks very much for coming on, guys. Um, obviously, your training at the moment is probably hampered slightly from uh, lockdown. What are you all up to, obviously, other, other than Phil, who's out in Pakistan at the moment? Me? Who wants to answer first? You go, Jamie. You, you're the youngest. Go on. Um, so, yeah, at the moment we're in pods. So I'm lucky enough to be joined by Stuart Meeker um, in one pod. Uh, so... It's been split up between four groups from those who are actually in England. Um, so it's between like seamers, batsmen, spinners. And uh, yeah, just skills, physical based training at the moment, just about mm. to go to the outdoor marquee. Um, so it's all trains leading into that at the moment. And then Jack, are you placed with spinners? Yeah, I'm with um, with Sauls, obviously head yeah, coach now, but has a spin background uh, with him and Beery. And then Dell's joined us this week from Bermuda. So, as I can say, mostly just kind of skill based work at the moment. Uh, a bit of scenario practice, whether that's building up a bit more now as we look to go on outside and towards the season. But yeah, it's just been good. It's been good to get back and just something to do during the day, really, as well, to be honest. Yeah, and then Phil, obviously, out in Pakistan at the moment for the uh, PSL. Uh, how's that going? Yeah, it's going all right. Uh, we've only had one game so far, so we've just been doing a lot of prep, really. We've trained five or six times now. Uh, we've got another game tomorrow night against Karachi. Um, so, yeah, can't complain, really. Not been home in a while, but mustn't <laughs> grumble. And I saw you doing some practice on a tennis court yesterday. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, we're supposed to train, um, but the, for some reason, the, we have, like, the security convoys everywhere we go. <laughs> And it wasn't cleared yesterday um, to go to the national stadium for one reason or another. So we sort of had to make do with whatever we would. And I like hitting a lot of basics, like hitting a lot of basic throws, basic front foot, back foot, punches, pulls, all that sort of stuff. Um, so I thought, why not get a few tape balls um, and do that? And I can still take care of my basics. Obviously, it's not competition. Um, but as Boat said on his Instagram story, you've always got to find ways to get better, I guess. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and then with regards to that, you've just come back from uh, the Big Bash as well. How was that and how is it different in terms of the two tournaments? Uh, big Bash is always very different because in Australia, you know, um, quicker, bouncier wickets. You have to sort of change your game. Um, not hugely, but it's just smaller stuff like um, the, the more instinct side of things. So I know that when I play in the Big Bash, I've got to aim squarer because the wickets are going to be quicker and bouncier. And, you know, I can't um, sort of get on the front foot and bully them straight back past the bowler like I uh, like I do to Meeks. <laughs> like sort of slow wickets. Um, you know, I've got to aim a bit square and, you know, if you give a width, you, it's more about sliding off more than slapping it. So just little things like that um, that, that you sort of try and tinker with. And then obviously coming over here, um, it's the exact opposite. It's back onto the slow wickets. So it's all about hitting nice and straight and not going square. Yeah, right. And then the two seamers, uh, Stuart and Jamie, how is it bowling at these sorts of guys in the indoor school? Obviously, it's quite a quick surface in there. Um, it must be quite good fun challenging yourselves against the likes of Phil trying to tee off every ball. Well, uh, like Phil said, luckily he's been away most of the winter, so we haven't had to bowl at him. Um, <laughs> that's mostly just been outside and every time I seem to have played against him. Um, but, you know, we've got... Uh, most of the practice we've done, in fact, all the practice we've done so far this winter has just been red ball stuff, so... It does even it out a little bit nicely or a little bit better between bat and ball. If it was a white ball, I might pull a hammy just so I don't have to bowl at them. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, it's, it's just been, look, it's been mostly practicing craft, getting your skills in, in good order. Um, and then, you know, as, as we move closer towards being outdoors or in the marquee, it'll just be about honing those skills with the accuracy. So, you know, it's one thing to be able to swing it in and out and, and um, you, know, do, you know, use all your tricks and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, you've still got to be quite accurate with it at the same time. So um, as we get closer and uh, I guess less than a month now before our first preseason game, it's just about increasing the accuracy. So it's, it's been good. It's been challenging, obviously, because indoor surfaces are quite, you know, quite conducive to, you know, batting, as it were. Um, but, you know, we just remind them that if, if they're sticking their front foot down like Phil does all the time, uh, we've got a quicker bounce on the indoor surface, so it's much better. <laughs> and then, Phil, how is it 
if you are back at home training, facing the likes of Joffre Archer, uh, Jamie Stewart, you've got George Garton as well, who's pretty quick. Um, how's that in the indoor school? Yeah, to be honest, I don't really have much interest in facing them in the indoor school. Um, just, that's just me personally. I don't find it very realistic and it's not something that I sort of really want to be doing in the winter when you're going to go outdoors in whether it's a couple of months or a couple of weeks and have your front shin blown off so it's not really something I've got that much interest in um I prefer I, I do like doing like overload stuff um so I do like challenging myself but I like doing it sort of a bit more controlled like out of the bowling machine with the indoor balls if I want to work on short stuff um or a good one I used to do when I was in the UK a lot in the winter was um put sort of um it's like electrical wire uh, down on a good length, like a sort of iPhone cable's width. Um, and this is when Mike Yardy was a batting coach and we'd um, tape over it with a thick brown physio tape. And that way, whenever he got one in the right area, it'd nip, um, you know, it'd nip quite a lot as well. So you really got to be good and hold your position. So those are sort of my main go-tos when I'm working in the indoor school, but I don't like facing these boys in there too much. <laughs> and then... Uh, Jack, with relation to spin stuff, is it mostly target practice or do you do a lot of batters as well? Um, I've done quite a lot of batters actually this this last sort of month. Um, I kind of moving in between batters and skills. So I would do maybe like a week where I'd do batters and then maybe sort of two weeks ago looked at footage and kind of my feet and stuff weren't in the place where I want them. So then we go back to a bit more technical skill based stuff, bowling at targets, get my alignment right. And then going back to bowling at batters next week. So it's yeah, it's kind of trying to get the balance between you know, getting that repetition to get my movements right, but also you know I'm gonna bowl at batters in the season. So getting that, you know, figuring out how to get someone out as well is uh is a massive part of it. And then just having winter's good for you know having a play and trying to do a few tricks and see what you can do as well under when there's a kind of no pressure environment uh, just have a play and see see what you can and can't do as well yeah no sure and then alongside that are you guys all doing loads of gym work as well obviously feels a bit different because you're pretty much in season already um but you're the guys doing winter training yeah so there's a there's a fair amount um i think now that our sort of uh, actual netting has kind of ramped up we're we're bowling a lot more batters um uh, you know, throughout the week, the number of sessions we do kind of um, drops down. So we, I mean, obviously it's a combination of doing a lot of um, weights training and, you know, typically before we were back at the start of sort of mid February, um, we were doing three gym sessions a week. Um, and now it's dropped down to two because we need to include, you know, fielding sessions and um, running sessions, uh, sprint sessions. So it suddenly, you know, it, it can build up quite a lot if you're doing three gym, three weight sessions and all the other stuff on top of it. And now you're bowling two spells as opposed to one spell. So um, yeah, it's just sort of tying everything else in and making sure that you still have enough energy actually to be able to do all the skill work. Uh, that is probably the most important thing at the end of the day. So, um, but, this period now, before the season starts, we will overtrain uh, and make sure that we've got a lot of work in because when the season kicks off and you're traveling around and you're you know, on buses all the time and you're going from one fixture to the next and then you don't have quite the same amount of days to prepare in between, you've got to make sure that you've got a solid foundation before the season starts. And then Jamie and Jack, coming out of sort of like the academy system and the age group stuff, how did you find the difference in training? You know, was it more intense going into the senior stuff or was it sort of on the same path? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, when you go into that pro environment, it's, it's, it's much different. Uh, you've got a lot of, you're almost, you're not in the middle of the pack, you're at the bottom of the pack and you're looking to impress, um, which was the ma massive thing for me. I remember bowling to Phil last June and uh, the start of it, you know, wasn't my greatest performances, uh, but you know I think the what the academy are doing well is uh, they're preparing the academy youngsters to let, perform really well when they go and train with the pros. Uh, I think that's something that Richard House was doing really well. Um, but yeah, I think obviously the intensity goes up, especially having my first winter. Um, you know, it has a massive effect on the body as well. 
yeah, I think like the big the big difference I noticed is you know, maybe in the academy you did you know with school and stuff done like two pretty heavy days and then sort of you'd maybe one other day. But I think what I've really noticed this this winter is this kind of five back to back where you've got to be pretty kneeled on. You got to get your head around the gym session. You got to get your head around bowling at a batter. Like, you know, there's no real. You get the weekend off, obviously, but it's you know getting yourself kind of mentally ready to just go back to back to back and and make the most out of each day and not really try and not really coast through any. Which sometimes I think you'd have possibly got away with in the academy, kind of just going to hit a few balls, bowl a few balls. Whereas you know I've really noticed like you kind of have to be on every day, and that that's a massive challenge. That's what I find. And then in relation to that, do you guys also, as bowlers, do a fair amount of batting work? Or is that sort of a bit of a secondary thing? <laughs> yeah, for the first, like, before, you know, um, this winter, batting was a real secondary skill for me. Um, but you no, know, it's been really ramped up this winter. Um, me and Meeks have been lucky enough to face some uh, nice bowling on the bowling machine going into bowlers now. Um, so that's been decent, yeah. I'd like to face Jack soon, though. I haven't faced him yet this winter. <laughs> yeah, actually, to be fair, we've been, I mean, obviously, because of the way that the, the, the winter's been set up in pods, um, you know, due to, you know, the lockdown and the virus, it's actually been a bit of a blessing in disguise for us bowlers in that we've had a lot more focus on a lot more time designated to us to be able to work on our batting. I think often what happens is when you have the whole squad in, the batters get all the focus from the coaches and the batters, so the bowlers are left to kind of um, make do, or help each other out or, you know, get the odd little session here and there. Now, because it's a smaller group over the same sort of time frame, we've had a lot more time to work on our, on our batting skills. And it's actually been quite, quite pleasant um, for a change. And then Jack, actually, when you came to Guernsey a couple of years ago, you actually opened the batting. Is it something more of an all-rounder role that you want to play, or is it more dominant bowling? Uh, oh, definitely. Like, I know. I think I think I averaged seven with the bat in first-class cricket, so it's it's a big statement for you to sit here and say I want to be an all-rounder. But I think it's it's like if you know, it's not something maybe this year or next year I see myself a full all-rounder, but to build towards that for maybe three, four years down the line and you can do a role at maybe six. It just gives the team so much more balance. I think like see it with Moeen Ali and even Don Bass gives himself more of a chance. So if it doesn't go right with the with the ball, you still have that batting the fall back on and stuff like that. So um yeah, when I like coming through the academy and stuff at a at a bat in the top four, but as you say there's such such a massive step up really that you know my bowling's much closer to to being that standard of first class cricket at the moment whereas my batting isn't quite there but I'd say it's been good this winter to to really be able to have a focus on that as well and and you know strive towards uh looking at that kind of number eight or number six rule down down the line. Yeah no definitely. Um and then Phil just one last one from me before we move on to the questions for from the guys in the chat. Um do you have any superstitions before you go out to bat? Sort of right pad first, anything like that? Um I'm normally left pad first. Um, if I find myself doing something uh, that I perceive to be a superstition, like when I'm getting ready for the game, if I pick out the same, I don't know, it could be the same socks or something, I'll purposefully pick another pair um, or something like that. You know, if I had a good performance in, in that same pair, I'd purposefully pick out another pair because I don't think that helps anyone. When you start having superstitions and all the rest of it, it clouds everything for me, um, so I sort of go out my my own way to um, to not have that. But I know some guys do, um, and some guys stick to them religiously. And you know, if it works for you, it works for you. But um, I've tried; I've made a conscious effort in the last few years to sort of stay away from them. No, it's really interesting, actually. So, um, if we move on to the questions from the guys in the chat, if I ask a few to start with, so uh, Louis Day, young wicketkeeper in Guernsey here. He wants to know from you, Stuart, uh, who would be your dream captain to play under? Uh, it can be from any era and why. <coughs> that's, uh, that's a very good question. And no, Phil Salt, unfortunately, it's not you. Um, <laughs> um, 
to be honest, uh, I grew up uh, in South Africa um, you know, for the first sort of 12 years of my life. And um, <laughs> I was actually very fortunate to have played under one of the previous you know, great South African captains in Graham Smith. Um, you know, before Sussex, I was at Surrey and um, we managed to get him over for two years as our captain. Um, unfortunately, I mean, he was, at, he was at a different stage in his career then. I think he was very much, you know, at the back end of his powers. Um, but just as, a, as an enigmatic leader, someone who knew the game of cricket, uh, you know, um, inside out, and just the, the, the respect he commanded whenever he spoke in the team meetings and in, and in the dressing room, um, it, was, it was a great feeling. Um, and, and it's quite sort of inspiring to have someone like that in your dressing room. Um, so I guess I'd have to probably say, you know, him. Um, I was, and, and I was very fortunate to have had him. Um, he, he was captain of one of the greatest, you know, one of, not one of the greatest, but not far off, one of the best bowling attacks South Africa have ever had. And, um, you know, he had some brilliant tips for me when I was um, playing and you know, when he was around, I guess. Um, so yeah, I was really fortunate for it to be to be him, really. Yeah, and then one for for Phil. Uh, which league do you enjoy playing in the most, and why? Um, probably this one because I find it the hardest. Um, the bowling is probably the best standard of bowling um, in all the leagues. That's in my opinion. I've not played IPL yet, but um, you don't see the ball reversing in the IPL like it does here. Um, and there's generally no weak link um, in any attack over here, which is, um, you know, as a as a professional cricketer, my mindset is that I want to test myself against the best. And here I've had the best opportunity to do that. So this league probably for me. And then one for, for Jack again from Louis is, uh, where do you get your bowling inspiration from? Um, and then also what sort of favoured conditions would you like to bowl in? Uh, yeah, for me, actually, uh, obviously grew up in Ireland. Um, my club captain when I was growing up was also playing for Ireland at the time, an off-spinner. He named Kyle McCallan. Probably nobody really have heard of him, but played at the 07 World Cup against Pakistan, that great victory. So, yeah, he was, I modelled my action from him from I was about eight, eight years old. So, uh, yeah, uh, he was he was my inspiration to both spin. And then conditions-wise, uh I got very lucky last summer, actually, you know, playing in the height of the summer, kind of August, pitches are dry. Um, but I'd love to, I'd love to go to the subcontinent or India, somewhere like that. And, um, and bowl, whether it's a camp or, you know, a tour or whatever, I'd love to, I'd love to test myself there. Uh, especially seeing how those uh, wickets in the test series are going at the moment. It, um, yeah, it looks a bit more fun than bowling the indoor school, to be honest. <laughs> and then uh, Jamie, have you always been uh, pretty quick or naturally fast, or is it something that you've sort of developed over time? Um, and is it something you've had to work particularly hard at, or has that come naturally? Um, I've had quite a lot of ebbs and flows, uh, like growing up, uh, pace-wise. Under 10s, under 12s, I was like sort of sharpest for my age. Um, and then I had a real dip in all sort of confidence and pace around under 13, 14 level. Um, and then like towards the back end of my like growing for the pathway I sort of picked up the pace again um I think massively something to do with it is the physical side for me definitely um I saw when I was bowling at my fastest was when I was you know putting in the hours in the gym you know trying to get as physically strong as possible um and that's definitely something that's you know helped in the past few years but yeah throughout the age groups I've been moderate like moderately average um and then recently just because of the physical uh, picked up a bit of pace. No, good. Uh, nice to hear. So, uh, with that, if I jump across to uh, the Robinsons, I think they've got a few questions which they're going to ask themselves. So, if they would like to unmute. Um, this to Jamie. Can you remember what speed you bowled at twelve, and have you had your um, have you ha managed? How have you managed to develop your speed from like when you were like around the younger age group? Um, I feel massively, my, my speed when I was 12, I, I imagine was about late 60s, I reckon, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit slower, I don't know, um, 
but yeah, uh, when I was younger, I think massively for me was trying to correct any t small technical issues. Um, <laughs> um, so <laughs> see Phil's face glaring at me in the bottom, sorry. Um, no, it's little technical issues for me. Um, was it if it was my foot crossing over? That'd be probably the biggest thing to try and pick up pace when I was younger. So speaking to my coaches at the time, um, definitely throughout the age groups, helped me, you know, pick up pace. Um, and that was especially when I started talking to Kurtz and John Lewis at the time was when I got my action better. I, I corrected a few things and that was when I started to pick up a bit of pace. Um, and have you had your action modified at all, like by the coaches? Uh, yeah, constantly when I was uh, growing up, um, you know, under 15s, under 16s, it was always my action was very, very rogue. Um, I had one foot crossing over the other uh, limbs were everywhere. So it's a massive thing for Kurtz. And I was working with Maxi a little bit for when I was 15, 16. Um, and it was all constantly being modified. And now it's almost getting to a stage where it's almost kind of accepting that that's my action and uh, just trying to sort out a few things here and there. OK, thanks. Is there like a girls academy equivalent to the boys? Yeah, yeah. Um, girls academy is... Uh... Run, run at Backer at, at Falmer, I think, isn't it? Um, and it runs the same way. Uh, certain amount in tech each year, and then feeds towards the uh, uh, the women's senior team and into the Southern Vipers as well with that with that setup. So I think I think it's a fairly similar uh, pathway in regards to the boys. Um, just it's based at at Brighton Old Ridge Academy instead of at at Hove. And I think you've got one more question, the Robinsons, have you? Uh, yeah, um, this for Phil. How, how were you able to, like, build up your power from... Um, how were you able to develop your power, like, in your batting? Um, I think it was all quite natural because I grew up in Barbados, so um, I was sort of the smallest kid in, for, for a long, long time. Uh, probably still am now, to be honest. Um, but I just tried to sort of do what the other lads were doing, um, clear the ropes that way and play the exact same way as them because I didn't always play like that. Um, so probably just be, being around them. Um, one thing I've noticed with cricket, going through all the age groups and that sort of a thing is that the better players you're around, the quicker you develop. Um, and, and I think that's still true right up to the top level. Um, so probably just trying to, trying to emulate... Um, what they did. I know there's all sorts of power hitting things out there and you know every now and then I do dip in and out of that but I'm very mindful of what I take on board because in my mind your best swing is your most natural one um, and one thing I'd say is never ever go away from what's natural to you. Okay thank thanks. you. Okay if we go across to Barnabas Smith you got a couple of questions? Uh, yeah um, this is to the two batsmen uh, what are the three top bits of technique advice you would give to someone who wants to be a batsman? Um, the three best things I could tell you, um, the three things that I always review myself on, um, getting a solid base, making sure your eyes level and that you, you play the ball light. Um, you don't need to worry about much else than that, um, to be quite honest. Um, you know, you can get so caught up in where your elbow needs to be and where your hands need to be coming through. But if you've got a solid base, you're not on the move, your eyes are level and you're playing the ball nice and late, um, more often than not, if you've ticked all three boxes, the ball's come out of the middle. Thank you. And this is for the bowlers. Uh, you, you need to score 16 runs to win the T20 World Cup. Who would you prefer to face in the final over? Adil Rashid, Ben Stokes or Jofra Archer? I was hoping you were going to say Phil Salt there, because then that's a bit Um Well, for me, definitely not Jofra. Um, that's second bat. I'd, I'd probably, I'd, like, Adil Rashid is a, you know, he's a brilliant bowler, but I think if I'm going to face anyone, it would probably be him. I've got m more chance, I would say, than of 
hitting a few bombs off of his bowling than I would do off Joffrey's, uh, unless it's a top edge. Um, so I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with him on this front. Yeah, I'd back that. I don't think I'd see Joffre. Yeah, um, Ali Rashid can't bowl me a binder, so I'm I'm going with him as a. <laughs> Did you not take on Stokesy? Uh, after seeing what Brathwaite did them, we might get a little nervous, to be fair. Pull a few more yeah. slap balls, but uh, yeah, he's a title bloke. He's a title bloke. I reckon if he gets another chance, he, he's winning the game there. So I, I'm going to take Rashid. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, someone that uh, couldn't actually make it tonight, but is going to listen back in after the recording. Um, as a young batsman, this goes to Phil. So as a young batsman, is, do you think it's better to have a good defensive uh, base sort of technique around that? Or is it better to look at trying to whack the ball out of the park? Um, <laughs> the way I've always thought about it is that your attack is an extension of your defence. Um, so so I, I don't really know any different, to be honest. It's the way I've always played and it's the way I always will play. I'll, I'll never go away from that. And if any of you do see me go away from that, give me a quick slap around the head because I definitely shouldn't be doing that. But you attack's an extension of your defence um, and it's important to always remember that, I guess. And then one for uh, Jack. Uh, what, what do you feel is the best length to bowl as a spinner and why? And does that vary quite a bit from format to format? Yeah. Um, so for for red ball, um, me and me and Sauls have kind of worked out. It would be um, like eight lengths of your feet, like kind of uh, forward to back from the crease line. So that's pretty much your, for me. That's pretty much perfect if I can land it in that kind of spot. Um, so I practice that for a little disc down. That's the length I'd want to hit, and then yeah, that would be for red ball. And I would say it would definitely change for white ball, um, especially twenty twenty cricket. I think you're, for me, it would be I'd be as a spinner trying to hit, you know, the top of the stump slash kind of thigh pad length, or then uh, block hole uh, Yorker length. Kind of, I wouldn't want to be caught in between because uh, I think that's that's the length that will go in twenty twenty cricket. Um, but yeah, for for red ball, that that it. Eight feet from the crease line, it is pretty much bang on. Uh, yeah. And then another question uh, again for someone who is actually on the chat uh, from Casper is uh, which cricket skills did you focus on at the age of 14 and 15, and which ones helped you the most? It's probably most directly towards you, Jack, and Phil, because he's a batter that bowls a bit of uh, leg spin, actually. Uh, 14 and 15. It, it would have probably been trying to get more attacking because I was trying to get into the Barbados under 15 setup. Um, and I didn't really compare to a lot of the other cricketers uh, my age. They're all much bigger, bowled a lot quicker than me, um, hit the ball a lot further than me. So I was probably at the stage of my um, sort of development where I was trying to be more positive and, and take the game on, I guess. Yeah, and then for me on the bowling side of things, I think, it's just it, trying to trying to make sure you can spin the ball. Um, because as a spinner, you know that that's what you can do. That's what your your skill is to be able to spin it. I think it maybe like fourteen, fifteen. You know, maybe some boys that kind of roll it off the finger. Not much, not many revs, but land it quite well. Will do quite well in matches. But I think you know, good coaches, if you can really spin the ball, we'll be able to see that. Um, and then help you consistently land the ball you want to do it, but. If you don't have that, you know, ability to spin it um, from the start, it makes it a lot harder down the line. Would be my my piece of advice. And then we've got a question in on the chat um, from Harry Bisson. If you want to open up your microphone. Um, as a young off spinner, what would you recommend are the best like variations to learn for shorter formats? Um, yeah, so. Obviously, first you gotta have your start ball, um, and be as comfortable in that as you can. But I think now, like, it's it's being, you know, almost fearless enough just to try anything in the nets. You know, in a if in the nets, there's no pressure. You can you know, try Karen ball. You see Ashwin flicking them out. Uh, Simon Harmer even in the blast has bowled some, you know, kind of wrist spin leggies as well. Um, for white ball. 
So it's, if you can do it early, the earlier you start to learn it, again, the easier it'll make it down the line. Um, and I think red ball wise, it's more subtle variations. So being able to bowl an arm ball, um, being able to kind of undercut the ball to make it slide on, uh, and then vary varying your seam. But yeah, if the earlier you can learn to kind of you know strengthen your fingers to flick and stuff like that is, I mean, Phil will tell you from uh, the franchise circuit, it's it's priceless. Um, so yeah, that, that would be massive. So I mean, I've started kind of watch videos on YouTube. There's so many videos out there um, from like on Ashwin and Mujib and stuff about how they do it. So it's all there. It's just I wish I'd done it probably ten years ago. I'm gonna be better at it now. So yeah. Uh, thank you. But and um, as a batsman, Phil, what would you say are the best spinners you've ever faced? Uh, the best spinners I've faced. Obviously, Rash, but I've not actually faced him in a game yet, apart from T10. Um, Sunil Narine, he was pretty tough. He was throwing it at the time, so he was throwing a big leggy and a big offy. Uh, <laughs> so he beat me inside first ball, then he bowled the leggy and beat me outside, and then I just had a sweep and got up the other end, and then that was his over. Um, but probably those two, or even Majib. Majib's also in the same sort of mould as Narine, turns it both ways. Thank you. And then another person in the chat, uh, Arthur would like to know, and this goes out to anyone is, uh, when did you first start playing cricket and how did you sort of get into it? Go on, I'll take this one. I, I, um, I started playing, I think must've been about five or six years old. Um, I was actually very fortunate to have had um, my cousins were family friends with some Zimbabwean cricketers, cricketers called um, Heath, uh, Paul, sorry, Paul and Brian Strang and the, and the Streak brothers as well. And um, we were over there one Christmas and they just, you know, we had a little quick cricket kind of um, set up and we just played cricket in the back garden. They taught me how to bat, taught me how to bowl and I've been playing it ever since. And then again, open question to anyone. Uh, when did you realise that you obviously had a passion for cricket and that you wanted to pursue it as actually as a career? Um, probably, it was all about football for me until I was about uh, 12 or 13, I'd say. Um, and then from there, it was just sort of all the eggs in one basket. There wasn't much opportunity to play football in Barbados. Um, but then, you know, the reason why we're all on this Zoom call is because we love the game and, and we want to do as well as we possibly can. And I, I think that's just what I was doing at the time. I don't think there was any sort of conscious thought until I was, you know, able to earn a bit of money off it. that This is what I really wanted to do. I was just um, enjoying the game um, and loving what I did. And that's still what I'm doing today, I guess. I don't think that ever changes. Yeah, I think I think that's a massive one, like the, the enjoyment, like massive enjoyment factor. Um, like I know my upper sixth year, like in the academy, you know, looking trying to search good performance for a contract, and you kind of lose, you know, almost becomes too stressful because you're thinking about his career, etc. It was, and then I went to New Zealand last year in a gap year, and it was, you know, I was working a golf course, playing cricket, etc. Just having, and I got the fun back, and then that's when you make your best learning when you're enjoying it, when you're fully invested. It so yeah, that'd be my big piece of advice. And then probably one for you, Stuart, uh, given your longevity in the game, if you like. Uh, what is your proudest moment as a cricketer so far? Um, oh, look, it's, it's pretty easy. It's making my debut for England when I was out in India. Um, I think it was something, you know, ever since I was a kid, I'd always wanted to, to play cricket at the highest level I possibly could. And, um, you know, get, getting, getting the call up, uh, getting taken out to India, you know, you, when you play out there, you you really are, I guess, you feel like a rock star. Um, you know, sometimes we play in empty crowds here. And out there, there's it's packed crowds of eighty to hundred thousand at times, and it's an incredible, incredible feeling. So, um, yeah, I was just making my debut out there, and, um, and you know, sort of finally feeling like you know I'd achieved something, uh, you know, that I'd always wanted to achieve and um, it was an incredible 
incredible feeling. Was that in one of those sort of massive stadiums they've got out there as well? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the, the, my debut, I think it was at the Wankhede Stadium um, in Mumbai. And um, I'd actually, I wanted to be my first sort of trip out there. I'd, I'd um, uh, all sort of with, with Surrey as a, as an, as a pro, um, we went out there for pre-season. Um, but, you know, that sort of stadium, it wasn't as big as, say, Eden Gardens, um, where they can get you know, 100,000 people in plus. Um, but it, it, I promise you, it felt louder because everyone's much more on top of you. It's still a crowd of 60 or thousand or whatever it ends up being. But it was so, you know, it was, I just remember standing at the top of my mark, not really being able to think because I was so... The crowd were chanting so loudly and so, you know, like um, rhythmically that it was just, I had to sort of pause and just go, well, <laughs> this is ridiculous. So, yeah, it was, it was a big crowd. And then actually, we'll chat back into the uh, chat, Harry Newton, if you want to ask your question. Uh, yeah, um, this is to Phil. Um, you've been drafted for Manchester. Um, for the hundred, are you looking forward to playing in that? And what and what are your thoughts of the competition? I think it would be great. There's been so much negativity around it, and to be honest, I can't really see why. Um, I think it's going to be a great competition. We've got the best players in the world. Um, we've got a great team at Manchester. To be fair, um, you know, so to be honest, I can't wait to get stuck in. It's it's about time that England had a franchise competition. Thanks. And then, guys, a little question regarding sort of lead up to T20 matches. Um, we we spoken to Max Holden last week and he, he touched on the fact that uh, batters don't really face bowlers that much. Is that something you guys do as well? Is it more of the dog thrower and a, and um, more of machine work before a, a T20 and bowlers just bowling at some targets, you know, bowling Yorkers and slow balls, et cetera? Or do you actually have a proper full-on sort of scenario-based net, et cetera? I think I think T twenty wise scenario is the best way to go about it um, because T twenty is probably the format where you need to cross the line the most. Um, with four day cricket and fifty over cricket, you can sort of go a bit insular um, and you can get out there and you can sort of play your own game and sort of forget everything. But you know, if it's if it's the first ball of the game in the T twenty and you know that the bowler is your matchup, you've got to be looking to hit that first ball for six, if he misses length full or if he misses short or whatever you think your best match up on the ground is. Um, it's so important to to keep crossing the line. So I, I think you need that uh, sort of competition um, from facing a bowler in T20 more than any other format. Um, I can understand why some guys like the bowlers prefer, you know, bowling the targets to get confidence up. But I think the best way to go in T20 prep um, is to is to just compete and see where you're at. Yeah, from from like more of a bowler's point of view, um, I I think I agree. Like last year, we did a lot pre blast of almost games against each other, and as a bowler, you know, it it gives you that where if I nail a Yorker and it gets squeezed through point for four, you know, in the nets I can go got my Yorker, probably might have hit point there dot, whereas. You know, you have to think about that next ball in a scenario, um, and deal. You know, deal with the consequences of what's gone before, while keeping your mind ready for that, for that next ball, that next battle, and getting the skill right. So I think it's it's a, uh, it's brilliant to do as much kind of scenario stuff, because uh, in the nets as a bowler in twenty twenty cricket, kind of you just get lined up really, and um, whereas there's a scenario, there's obviously more on it for the batter as well. I feel like, yeah, I feel like it's a great way to practice. Is that done out in the middle, or is that in a sort of still a bit of a net scenario? Uh, I can do it. It can be done in a net, but I feel like yeah, the best way is probably done in in the middle. Like as I say, we did a lot of that uh, last year. It was kind of my first year, obviously being in around the twenty twenty squad. But yeah, we did just out in the middle, almost kind of two teams type of stuff. Um, and it, again, it lets batters know, you know, how far they far they hit the ball, if they've hit a gap if they've beaten the man that's left or if it's hit him and stuff like that. So it gives you that real, real good feedback. Um, and you can obviously tailor it, like, you know, for bowlers to bowl at the death, bowlers to bowl at the top. Um, so, yeah, I think out in the middle usually is, is where that, that best practice would happen. 
And then, Phil, with regards to the different formats, obviously you're, you're playing in pretty much every format going. Um, how do you sort of change your mindset and the way you approach those games? Obviously, in the county season, you go from pretty much county championship the next day is pretty much a blast game and then back to county championship. Um, f- for me, well, it's a kiss of death, isn't it? Saying that I don't mind changing formats and that I think I do it quite well. Um, not too much changes with my game. Um, my setup's the exact same. Um, I want my bat swing to be the exact same, but I'll just be more selective on sort of what balls I'm hitting. Because, you know, you go out in a T20, sort of everything's got to go. That's the way that I play. Um, I'm always looking to be positive where, where, you know, if I go into a four-day game um, and somebody bowls me a wide half volley, it doesn't matter if it's a half volley or not. If it's wide and I nick it, then I'm going to go back into the dressing room and and get a spray off off whoever that will be. And, you know, the team will be in a bit of trouble. Um, so changing formats, you just got to sort of eliminate those sort of poorer dismissals um, in the longer format. And if you if you stick to a sort of tight game plan, like my game plan is, you know, punching strong down the ground, um, playing the pull shot from sort of back of length. Um, if, if I can commit to those and execute those well, then then that's as complicated as it gets for me, really changing formats. There's not too much that's different. And in terms of bowlers, do you, do you guys find the same? It's relatively easy to change formats. Um, I remember there was a time ago when um, we were playing championship games on, I think it was like a, a, a Sunday, and we we're finishing on a Wednesday. We'd have one day off, and then we'd have a, um, a T20 game on the Friday. And often, sometimes it could have just been straight after a championship game. And I remember changing formats was incredibly difficult in those circumstances because, um, you know, you you might end up having to field for a day and a half trying to win a game and bowl a side out, you know, having bowled 20 something overs and being absolutely knackered to then having to go and nail a Yorker and execute all your slower balls, uh, you know, in a really fast paced T20, you know, not even a day after. Um, and that was tricky, but I think now with the way that it's set up in blocks, um, you know, you get to focus your skills uh, on that, that um, you know, that given format at a given time. And it's become a lot easier for us bowlers to be able to get back into the, you know, the, the, the mindset of what we're trying to achieve in any given form. Um, and I've, often I find the harder way to adjust is to go from a T20 one day setup back into red ball because um you know you, you if you think about your action you're trying to sort of either lower your arm and get your yorkers in in a one day format and you're bowling all these sort of slow balls and all that sort of stuff which when you're then getting back into red ball cricket and you're trying to learn to you know hold your action in a certain place and, and swing the ball away and you know then trying to swing the ball back in and hold certain positions and do it repetitively it can be quite tricky um, and um, yeah, I've always found that adjustment a little bit trickier um, but by, by and large now with the way that it's set up throughout the year it is much easier than it used to be. And then also something just aside from cricket how do you guys switch yourselves off from cricket obviously uh, it's quite intense um, and it's a bit of a strange game in terms of you're playing a team game but you're very much an individual at times as well. So how do you switch off outside of it? Um, I, to be honest, I switch off. I don't ever feel like I really can uh, because I feel like the moment I take my foot off the pedal, um, other people will sort of get by me. It's probably not the healthiest mindset to have long term. Um, but the, the best way that I can switch off is to work as hard as I can. Um, and then I can come back to my hotel room or apartment or wherever I am um, and just sort of say I've done all that I can today I'll do all that I can tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and just have some sort of peace in that I like from, your from, from, from <laughs> Phil I was going to say from <laughs> countering that from Salty because like, like you say that I've been there and then you know often the problem is, is you don't end up switching off mentally you might go back to your hotel room but you're constantly thinking about it and it's on your mind and then sometimes it might affect your sleep and you know creates a bit of anxiety because you think i need to do more i need to do more and you can't switch off and so actually just having that little mental distraction you know uh, whether it is something like 
either you get outside or you you pick up a hobby or you know what a lot of guys tend to do is you know parents excuse me for saying it but a lot of the guys tend to get back onto the xboxes and the the playstations because it does it switches the mind off from from the sport which is on your mind all the time to something completely different um but you know long-term health wise is probably not necessarily the best thing and often the it's just finding other little hobbies, other little passions, which you can, you know, take up, which just get your mind thinking about other things other than I have to do well tomorrow, or I didn't train enough today, or I, you know, I, I need to do more, or it's just on your mind, I didn't execute that slower ball. So for me, it's just about completely finding other things, you know, I'll get out on the paddle board or, um, you know, go, go, go relax on the beach. Cause actually in, in we're out on the field all the time and we're standing up all day um spending time off of your feet uh, is actually quite important so um maybe counter to what the parents are, are wanting to say to your kids uh, and this <laughs> these days but um for us pros standing around and salty having to watch me get belted around the field all day it might get quite <laughs> quite tiring <laughs> yeah. and then sort of final question um for each of you to answer individually what's the best bit of advice uh you've either a been given or you would give to somebody now who's aspiring to be a professional john cast you go for this you start us off um yeah i think probably um for me it would be to like you know like you hear it a thousand times but it's like in enjoying the process of kind of of chasing whatever you're chasing whether that's like at school or or whatever your your hobby if it's cricket or, or whatever it is it's it like enjoying the day-to-day -day process of, of working to get better um because it is like it is a massive process and you know it's only when you kind of look back and you realize how how much you've improved or how much how far you've come so i think yeah in enjoying enjoying the process of it and uh yeah making you know in, enjoying your own success as well like it's it's not the worst thing to, to you know realize when you've when you've done something well as well and, and give yourself credit for that um it's it's very easy to be to be you know notice the things you don't do very well um especially like in a professional environment and focus on those but definitely you know enjoy your own success and, and know what you do well as well i'd have to say the same as cast i think the more you enjoy what you're doing, the more you enjoy your training, the easier the hard yards get. Um, for me, especially, the more I enjoy, you know, being in the gym, the more I enjoy bowling. Uh, I feel like the better, the better, and more, the more improvement I get from day to day. Um, and it almost it gives you an incentive to work harder. I think for me. Um, from my side, um, I mean, yeah, I absolutely agree with them. Um, but I think for me, it's something slightly different. It's, I think it's, if you find something that motivates you, uh, find your motivation. Uh, I know it sounds a bit cliche, but you know, I've played this game for and coming up to 14 years now. And the difference I've seen between people who have, come in, done all right, or done well initially, and then dropped out and then, and, um, and then sort of faded. And the guys that have gone consistently to next level, higher level, next level on top of that, and continually done it throughout their career, they've found their motivation. And that can change throughout your, your time and your career as well. And um, because that's the thing, you know, whether, and look, it might, it might be money, it might be fame, it might be because you just really enjoy playing the sport and you want to play it for as long as you can at the highest level you can. Whatever it is, constantly like, remind yourself of that all the time and in anything that you do, because that's the thing that gets you up in the morning. That's the thing that gets you to the gym, uh, you know, on the, on the rainy days or the days where you just not, you don't have any energy. And that's the thing that continually pushes you to improve, to get better, to, to um, you know, um, reach higher levels as a sportsman. Um, and that's where the enjoyment comes in for me, is seeing that you constantly then are improving and doing well and getting better each day. 
Um, it's, it's easy to say, well, I just enjoy it. Um, find the motivation that's going to push you so that you then enjoy it when you're doing well. That's, that's one thing I would probably add. Yeah, I'd probably follow on from that. I think that's a great answer, what you've just said. Um, best thing I've probably ever been told was around my training is that get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, always try and push yourself and always want to be the best um, because you won't be the best version of yourself unless you unless you try and as hard as you possibly can and giving it a full crack all the time. But one last thing for me, sorry, um, is just write things down as well. Like stuff that Phil's coming out here, makes coming out here with last you know pros for a number of years. Just write it down because you don't remember it. You remember it for a day or so. Uh, stuff you learn at training, like something text you, just write it down. Um, and then you can build that up over years and you've got banks of knowledge that you look back and go, oh, that's big. Oh, why I haven't been doing that for a few months? That's that's big for me. With my... So it, yeah, write, write things down. No, oh, excellent. And thanks very much guys for taking time out your evenings uh, to, to jump on and answer the questions from all the guys on this chat. Cheers guys. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.